Uh, this week I'm joined by Bradley Hope and Justin Sheck. Um, they're the author of this. Uh, they're the authors of this fantastic book, uh, Blood and Oil: uh, Mohammed bin Salman's Ruthless Quest for Global Power. Uh, for people who don't know who you are, would you mind just uh, outlining um, what you do and why you've written this book? Sure, I'll just start a little bit. Um, so my name is Bradley Hope. I'm a reporter in London for the Wall Street Journal. And um, I, I kind of cover a, a variety of financial topics primarily, usually involving sort of a deeper dive into, you know, following money flows around the world. And I've also was previously based in the Middle East, uh, especially during the Arab Spring. And so I have a, I spent about three years in, in the Gulf and then three years kind of traveling around the rest of the region. So th those are sort of my two, two interests that kind of combined on the subject of Saudi Arabia. And I'm, I'm Justin Sheck. I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal also uh, based in New York. And I work on uh, stories, uh, investigative stories involving money, oftentimes international flows of money, and started writing about Saudi Arabia with Bradley uh, about four years ago while we were both based in London. And I really came to Saudi Arabia uh, with, with very little experience working in the Gulf at all. And so for, for me, it was a new thing and uh, a story that, you know, from covering it at the journal very quickly became something that was, you know, deeper and, and, and more uh, important and more uh, interesting than, than, than I could have imagined and, and sort of translated into, into the book. I suppose what's striking about the book is that there's no footnotes in it and you say that the sources are anonymous. Uh, did, did that mean that the book was actually quite hard to compile? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, uh, obviously, um, with such a sensitive topic, I mean, you know, the average Saudi person doesn't feel comfortable to speak about the subject of politics itself, much less about particular things or specific things relating to the royal family. Um, so there's a real political illiberalism, and there's, there's not really freedom of speech in any meaningful way. And so, and obviously people who are of, in positions of power or, or were in the and the, had the ability to know things, um, they they would be putting themselves at great peril. And you know, we could have done we could have done a lot of footnotes the footnotes that said anonymous interview in London, in Paris, in New York, in Geneva, whatever. But we just felt we might as well not be so you know disingenuous. We'll just tell you, listen, um, a lot of what we're doing here is done by Wall Street Journal standards, which is you know to a very high level of accuracy but we can't really describe to you all the ways we know things, you know? So there's, there's lots of uh, interesting leaders to focus on in the world. You could do Putin, Xi Jinping, Erdogan. Why was it uh, MBS? What, why was it MBS that, that we wrote about? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, a lot of it is sort of happenstance. So we'd been based in London, and at the time, you know, Bradley had this history uh, writing, you know, in the Gulf and writing about the the Gulf and Gulf money. And I had been uh, on and off writing about oil and energy for a few years. And what had happened was that, you know, Saudi Arabia was this like sort of sleepy place where everything was the same for a very long time. And all of a sudden, um, this new prince who nobody had heard of announced that they wanted to take the state owned oil company public in what would be the world's biggest ever stock offering. And so, uh, we and our editors are like, wait, there's something that's very different here. This is not the Saudi Arabia we expect. This could have a profound effect on the energy industry, but also on, on international relations, on geopolitics. And so um, there, there's just a big shift there that it was clear there was something to dig into and something to write about that was happening differently. Whereas, you know, Erdogan is a separate thing. China is a separate thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for people who don't know, who is MBS and... How did he rise to power? Well, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is the son of King Salman. And for most of his life, he was a pretty much unknown uh, kind of, I guess, third generation prince, of which there are hundreds, uh, if not more than a thousand of them. Um, there's, 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 you know, uh, in the in uh, upwards of 10,000 princes and princesses <laughs> in Saudi Arabia, maybe even more. It's kind of hard to say for sure. Um, and, and really... He was, he was kind of 
this character who who obviously had uh, he, he started to kind of leave a mark in Saudi Arabia. He was he was running these things like the Riyadh Competitiveness Council and things that really was on nobody's radar as a, a major figure, but he was gaining a reputation for being quite brusque and for and being forceful and even you could even say a bit brutal with with how he was doing things you know he, and and he also had this kind of obsession with with um running things like a business you know he had been a businessman for a few years before he got into government um and then a series of of events happened in a kind of perfect storm in a sense that made it possible for muhammad to become this ultra powerful person in saudi arabia first of all Two of his uncles died uh, in quick succession, which meant that his father, who was kind of um, obviously a powerful person, but kind of on the on the periphery, suddenly became next in line for the throne. And also, um, it, out of out of the ordinary for Saudi Arabia, he was very close with his father, and his father kind of elevated him above his older brothers, which is a pretty rare thing in a, in a Saudi family. Um, perhaps because he was the most uh, like. Salman himself, because he he had he stayed in Saudi Arabia, he grew up there, he went to university there. He wasn't one of these sort of um, high and mighty princes that spent their whole time in Paris or London and and developed a, a love for horse racing and things like that. And so, uh, when his father became the king, he he played a, a big big role in the transition and protecting his father and amassing money that that he needed to kind of build largesse. And then um, as soon as his father became the king, he empowered Muhammad to do a huge number of things. In a way, he empowered him to be more powerful than any prince has been since the founder of the country, um, giving him the economic portfolio initially, the defense portfolio. And then over time, through his own actions, he sort of consolidated power and become the most powerful person in the Middle East. Uh, so I'd like to touch more on the, the economic as aspect that you you, you mentioned there, and you talk about it extensively in the book. So within the first few days of uh, becoming Crown Prince, uh, he becomes the chair of the Council of um, Economic and Development Affairs. Uh, he's he's uh, introduced consultancy firms into the country, McKinsey, which you talk about in, in the book. Uh, how has he transformed the economy? Well, he hasn't yet. And that's that's one of the real challenges is that he has promised to transform the economy. And he's, he says what um, people inside and outside Saudi Arabia have been saying for decades, which is that uh, it's not sustainable to have an economy that's almost completely based on oil. I, I think in the past, the belief was that that was because the oil would run out. I think increasingly now there is a concern that the demand might run out before the oil runs out. But either way, um, people in Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's allies in the U.S. and Europe have been telling the kingdom for decades, you need to transition away from oil to, to have some kind of diversified, like, real economy, or else you're just going to go back to being an impoverished desert nation. And Mohammed bin Salman has said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the one to do that. And he's come up with a plan or, or multiple plans to do that. They include... Um, some of the, you know, the, the social and economic liberalization, like making it easier to start a business, trying to bring women into the workforce, uh, as well as investing oil money that Saudi Arabia has in tech companies and foreign companies and trying to bring foreign companies to Saudi Arabia. The problem is that every company and every money manager wants Mohammed bin Salman's money, but no one really wants, no one from America or Europe really wants to enter Saudi Arabia as like a major business destination because it has this sort of opaque court system. It has a, a, a difficult, uh, like long said, like sort of a like difficult regulatory system. It's hard to start a business. The, the rules aren't clear. There's reputational risk. And also it's just like not that big a market. It's got like 30 million people it's the size of Mexico city, you know? So, so if his economic transformation is staked on bringing foreign companies to Saudi Arabia, it's going to be very difficult to do. And it's also very difficult to kind of start a ground up economy when you don't really have taxation. Like there's people aren't meaningfully taxed in Saudi Arabia. And so if he's going to start instituting taxes to create some sort of self-sufficient government away from oil, then, you know, I think we have a long history of people saying, I don't want to be taxed unless I have some say in my own governance and that threatens the monarchy. So there are all these challenges there to actually transforming the economy that it's not clear how, how he's going to try to do it, but he certainly hasn't successfully done it yet. 
I think it was really interesting as well. Uh, you talk about how he's weaponized social media to sort of cultivate popular legitimacy. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, Mohammed bin Salman was is really you know, a millennial crown prince. You know, growing up, he was um, just as enamored by technology, computers, video games, as any typical British or American teenager. And and like all Saudis, he spent a lot of his time on social media, on multiple phones. You know, the average Saudi person, if you meet them, I mean, the average sort of relatively well-off Saudi person will have two or three phones. They'll be on Instagram, Snapchat, you know, it's really, and, and it's really kind of a symptom of the repressive society they lived in. They had to live their lives virtually and they could be a little bit more inappropriate, a little bit more edgy in social media, but not on the streets or, and, and not really in any, any kind of public places. They couldn't really mix between sexes, that sort of thing. So he understood that his mandate in a sense, although not technically a mandate, his, his support came from the youth of Saudi Arabia, which is you know somewhere around 70% or under 30. And so early on, he knew he needed to focus on social media because the perception of him on social media was the key factor. It was more important than the, the, the kind of old fashioned newspapers and stuff. The youths didn't read that. They, they were on Twitter mostly. And so he was, he was really focused on that. And also as a result, because he was, um, he, he believed, he believed and in a way, rightfully he believed, there was a lot of attempts to undermine him, him as a person, also his father's authority. And to kind of, you know, there was a lot at stake in this succession. It could have gone to the different uh, corners of the family and whoever won essentially uh, had extraordinary wealth, but also they could kind of control the succession process going forward. You know, there's no reason why it has to go in any kind of, even a familial democracy, you know? And so, um, and, and so very early on, we describe in the book, a lot of Justin's reporting around how they, they, there was these Twitter accounts, people kind of leaking things, saying things that were negative and they were followed, you know, by maybe more than a million people. And they were desperate to find out who's behind this, you know, what, what's this conspiracy, which other prince is leaking to them, that kind of thing. And so on one hand, they were concerned about shaping the perception. And, and on the other hand, they were hunting down people that were essentially putting out negative information about them, true or false. And you know, I would say underlying that, you know, in addition to the shift from traditional state controlled media to, to social media for people to get information, there was this shift where, or a shift that Mohammed bin Salman is banking on, where the legitimacy of the royal family came historically from the religious establishment. Um, going back to the founding of the kingdom, uh, Mohammed bin Salman's grandfather founded the modern Saudi Arabia through an alliance with these very conservative uh, Islamic fighters. And they, that has sort of translated into the current Saudi religious establishment. And for decades, the legitimacy of the royal family came from the people knowing that the clerical establishment said, these are our, our rulers and, and we should respect them and, and, and be loyal to them. And I think Mohammed bin Salman realized that with the rise of social media, you had all these Saudi, I mean, Saudi Arabia is among the highest smartphone penetration, highest social media usage of the world. You had all these young Saudis, you know, the majority of the population is below 30, spending all day looking on their phones, seeing on like Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter, what their peers in other wealthy countries were doing, which is like starting their own companies or going on dates or going to concerts or going to the movies, which are all things you couldn't do in Saudi Arabia. And I think Mohammed bin Salman came to believe that with the current younger generation of Saudis, legitimacy wouldn't come from the clerical establishment who are the people who are saying, you can't go out, you, you can't you know, go out during prayer time, you can't have your ankles uncovered. It, it would have to come from uh, someone who, who's able to offer them more opportunity and give them more of what they expect or what they hope to have in, in the modern, in like, you know, a modern world where they can see what everyone else has. So he's hoping that legitimacy will come from the young people and the opportunities he gave that he gave them rather from from the old religious establishment i'd like to ask a bit more about uh foreign policy so the relationship between saudi arabia and uh the united states goes back to woodrow wilson e e even um what's mbs's relationship with donald trump been like well um in a way it, it, donald trump made his ascent 
uh, more possible than perhaps any other kind of, if, if it had been Barack Obama or if it had been, uh, I mean, Barack Obama was the president during the early days of MBS, but, but Donald Trump really made it possible for MBS to do some of the quite aggressive things uh, he probably would have been, the, the U.S. would have put a lot of pressure on them not to do. You know, for example, the the Ritz crackdown where everybody was arrested and put inside the Ritz-Carlton Hotel or the the kind of uh, kidnapping of, of Hariri from Lebanon. And, and in general, the, all the kind of wild things MBS did, the quite aggressive things, I think a stronger um, U.S. foreign policy would have tried to counter that or, or put in place disincentives for them to do that. Um, so I think uh, early on, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily that MBS has a great personal rapport with Donald Trump. Um, probably he has more of that with Jared Kushner, but he really, uh, it seems to us at least, figured out Donald Trump from the beginning. He knew exactly what this guy wanted. He wanted to be treated like a king. He wanted to be lavished with gifts, his face broadcast on the big you know, building facades. And he also wanted to have the headlines, the big number headlines, hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions. Even if they were semi, semi-fictional, he cared more about the headlines than the actual transactions, Donald Trump. And I and think- so, yeah. Sorry, no, no, Go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought you were done. Yeah, so I'm just saying, I think, you know, this event where, where this, this persuasion of Donald Trump to come to Saudi Arabia was because Mohammed bin Salman knew exactly what Trump wanted and laid it all out on a menu and told the aides to Trump, listen, this is what we're going to do if you come here. It's going to be way different than if you take your first trip to Canada or Mexico, as you traditionally do, where you'll be sort of, it'll be kind of a light uh, event. It'll, it, won't be a, it won't be a major, you know, uh, change in the way the American foreign policy works, you know. Justin? Yeah, and I think, I think one of the other important things to understand is that um, Mohammed bin Salman had a lot to gain uh, by, by aligning himself with Trump and making it seem as if he had influence with Trump and over Trump and also could control access to Trump for other people in Saudi Arabia and for other uh, leaders of, of Muslim countries. And so, you, you know, the big, there was a lot of tension between the Obama administration and the Saudi royal family over a number of issues. Part of it was, you know, Hillary Clinton's uh, frequent confrontations with them. You know, whenever they meet in person, she'd bring up women's rights, which was a constant source of annoyance. But bigger than that was the Iran nuclear deal. And uh, Saudi Arabia felt betrayed by the decision of the Obama administration to make a deal with Iran. And so Mohammed bin Salman was able to, um, you know, when Trump came in, get Trump to come to Saudi Arabia uh, through his, uh, you know, he and the UAE leadership and, and others, you know, spoke with the Trump administration about the Iran deal. The Trump administration scrapped the Iran deal, which Mohammed bin Salman could, uh, truthfully or not, take some credit for. And then he made this big public showing where they invited the leaders of most of the world's Islamic countries to Saudi Arabia and kind of brought Trump out in front of them to, to show that Mohammed bin Salman is the person who has the relationship with Saudi Arabia's most important ally. And if you want to get to Trump, I, Mohammed bin Salman, and the one he trusts, who can, who can be the link. And so it helped Mohammed bin Salman solidify his power and show that he was worthy of being the next king. Um, whereas Trump really didn't get very much out of that, other than, as Bradley said, you know, the headlines of you know, billions of dollars worth of potential deals. Uh, Trump already had Saudi Arabia as an ally. He didn't really have much to gain from it, but um, he was satisfied with the, sort of the appearance and the glitziness of all of it. Yeah, and just one other small comment, which is, is if, if maybe typically foreign policy is a balance between values and interests, um, and, and these Gulf countries, what they prefer is a con- other countries dealing with them only on the terms of interests, not about values, you know, not about any shared values between them. And so that's why all the Gulf countries found Donald Trump so refreshing, because he had no values that he was trying to suggest or impose upon them. He was just transacting, you know, they li- that's what they like. Well, on this, uh, we can't escape the, the fact that uh, the United States has got a new president or it will have in January. Uh, how do you see the relationship with Saudi Arabia being changed under a Biden administration? One thing I would say is that there's not a lot to, that you can do easily 
I mean, Mohammed bin Salman has set things up where he is the de facto ruler of the country. And um, there's no, you know, there's no reliable or even, you know, viable um, opposition or another, another senior prince who would dare kind of step up within or external. And so I think that Biden would find himself limited into what he can do. And also the way that the Gulf states have started this sort of domino effect about, about normalizing relationship with Israel, um, both the Democrats and the Republicans would, would agree that they want normalization with Israel. And so Saudi Arabia is the, is the, is the keystone of that policy. If, if Saudi Arabia doesn't do it, then the rest of it doesn't really matter. And so they're going to be hoping, even if it is kind of Donald Trump's legacy, that Saudi Arabia will come next. And if, that, and if they do do that, um, which is, is, is something that's very risky for Mohammed bin Salman in, in some ways, um, that would be the linchpin of Middle East security strategy is this normalized relationship between the Gulf states and Israel that will change the dynamics of everything else. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think so. I think, you know, the Biden, um, Biden did a lot of, Biden handled a lot of foreign policy matters when he was vice president. And he has people who worked for him then who have a lot of experience in the Middle East and a lot of experience with Saudi Arabia and were very supportive of the Iran deal and very skeptical of Mohammed bin Salman, which isn't to say that it, it could threaten Mohammed bin Salman's eventual ascent to the throne. Uh, you know, I don't think they saw it as their role to try to um, influence who was, who was going to be the next king, but they were very skeptical. They, they treated... Saudi Arabia as an ally of whom they were skeptical and who they wanted to keep somewhat at arm's length because they felt their, their interests weren't completely aligned, which is to say the U.S. felt the best way to achieve long-lasting peace in the Middle East was to bring Iran to the table, try to get Iran to agree not to have nuclear weapons and have some kind of deal and have everyone sort of back off. Whereas what Mohammed bin Salman and the current Israeli leadership seems to think is that the best way to uh, manage the Middle East is to create this axis that involves Israel, the Gulf states, Egypt, now Sudan, against an axis that includes something to the effect of Iran, Turkey, Qatar. And I think the Biden people are very skeptical of the idea that having two completely opposed sides, with completely opposed interests, is going to create a peaceful future. So I. I, it's hard to say how they're going to approach this and what they're going to do. And it's probably said it's not a lot concrete that they can change, but I think there's going to be a much, a, a lot less leeway for Mohammed bin Salman to kind of do things that the American people think are like shockingly inappropriate or bad. And for the president to just sort of ignore it. I, I think that the U S will now become at least sort of a, a nagging, uh, a nagging problem for MBS, if not, uh, some you know countries trying to push him in a different direction. And uh, what's drawn uh, what's drawn the the most attention perhaps to uh, MBS's leadership is the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, what evidence is there that he was complicit in that? Um, I think there, we we don't know anything that closes the gap between you know his team did it. And, and him, like, we don't know of any particular instruction or anything like that. We don't know more than anyone else. And I think, I'm not sure that anybody in the world knows, including intelligence agencies, their kind of a view is that it's a moderately to high likelihood that Mohammed bin Salman carry, um, ordered the killing. But the one thing that we can say that's kind of in our book is that um, early on, Mohammed bin Salman created this sort of black ops team that were set up to do kind of secret things and even things that would be considered unsavory. And one of the main ones we describe is this prince being uh, uh, rendered back to Saudi Arabia by trick. You know, they, they tricked him onto a 747 he thought was going to Cairo, but actually he went to Riyadh and he's never emerged again. Um, he's believed to be just detained um, and, and in Saudi Arabia in a villa somewhere. So I think that it's important though, because he created this team. They answered to him. It was his kind of alternative structure that he could use to do things, whether it's espionage or 
or kidnappings to some extent. And so when, when, you, when you learn later on that this is the same team that carried out this assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, it makes it look very clearly like it's something that he's fully responsible for. Now, the only thing that you sometimes hear from people is that maybe there was a, um, a misunderstanding that, that led it to get more extreme. And, and I would say, I don't really believe that or disbelieve it, but I would just say that there are no other known assassinations under MBS like this. You know, this is not like a pattern of assassinations. Most of them were kidnapped and brought back. So there's something about this that it led to it to be a killing. And we just, we don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I think one thing to understand uh, contextually is that, you know, first off, Mohammed bin Salman has said he's responsible in the sense that these were men working for him. And they did this. And so he's accepted some responsibility, even though he says he didn't tell them to do it. But I think one thing that I think gets lost is that um, when dealing with their own citizens, the Saudi royal family and the Saudi rulers have seem to treat them as with a sort of a proprietary sense that we don't like expect from in a Western government. Like it's hard to imagine the UK government or the US government, you know, put it this way, like Mohammed bin Salman's reaction has been sort of like, Jamal Khashoggi is a Saudi citizen. He's my person. I can do what I want with him. Uh, and they've treated other Saudis like that, who, they, who they've rendered back to Saudi Arabia or they, they've brought back. And so I, I think, you know, he, his men clearly had orders to do something with or to Jamal Khashoggi. Most likely, it seems like it was bring him back to Saudi Arabia and, you know, something went awry or they decided to, you know, take it to another level. But um, as Bradley said, you know, the direct, there's, we don't have, have the direct communication from him but it's pretty clear that they were working for him and they were doing something to or with Khashoggi at his orders. And of course it, it soured relationships with Turkey and uh, Erdogan was leaking information to the press, which uh, didn't go down well, but it, how, how significant has it been for Saudi Arabia's global stand in this moment? Well, I think Turkey is something we write about a little bit. The Turkey situation is, was, is pretty, pretty nuanced and interesting where Erdogan had a very tense relationship with King Abdullah, the prior king, uh, because Erdogan had been aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood and Saudi Arabia sees the Muslim Brotherhood as, you know, public enemy number two after Iran. And Erdogan was optimistic that when Salman became king, Mohammed bin Salman's father, Salman became king, they could improve relations with Saudi Arabia. And he came to see Mohammed bin Salman as the main obstacle to that. So what Erdogan was doing when he was leaking information, part of the strategy was to try to squeeze Salman into taking power away from Mohammed bin Salman, to try to, if not completely sideline him, to just get him to be less influential in, in, in relations with Turkey. And it looked like it worked in the sense that you know, Saudi Arabia was humiliated and shown to be lying time and time again as Erdogan released information. But in the long term, or even the medium term, it really didn't work because Mohammed bin Salman came out of the whole mess as powerful as he'd ever been. So what it means is, you know, relationship, the relationship with Turkey is, is really not good right now for Saudi Arabia. The relationship with the U.S. was, you know, pretty much unscathed. But I think that's, there's going to be probably some change to that with, uh, with the new administration coming in. But in the rest of the world, it left this stain on Mohammed bin Salman that, that showed him to be... Uh, or created the image that he was someone who was willing to resort to extremely brutal measures to deal with someone who wasn't really a, a, a threat, it, 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 except for, you know, saying things he didn't like. And whether Mohammed bin Salman ordered it directly or not, it's made people think of him as, as, as a brute rather than as, uh, you know, a, a thoughtful ruler. And it's going to be very hard for him to shake that. Would you like to expand on that, Bradley? No, I think that's I think that's captures my views as well. Um, so, why was it Khashoggi? What what was so important about him? How significant was he as a critic? Well, I think yeah, that's an important question because one of the things we really tried to get into in the book is about his the the perceptions of Khashoggi. Um, you know, he was somebody who had spent his whole life in the kind of inner circle or, or within the, the, a circle close to the inner circle. And, and um, 
he was really less of a kind of independent journalist that we might think of uh, in the UK or the US. He was essentially a state-sponsored or a royal-sponsored journalist. He had his own views, of course, but he would he was always doing so on the payroll of the Saudi government. He spent some time as a spokesman for the Saudi government, and he always had that kind of combined role. And I think for for what we found was that he he was sort of pushed. He was sort of when MBS kind of rose up, it was it was black or white, either or. You were on his side or against him, and he very quickly was perceived to be against the the reform project. And then when he went to the U.S. and started writing these columns in the Washington Post. He was doing other things too that were would be disturbing to Saudi Arabia's top echelons, especially since they were surveilling him to some extent or through people around him. You know, there was there was some malware on one of the people he knew on their phone. So so they they had a sense of what he was up to, and he was he was coordinating or or, or initially about to coordinate with the 9/11 plaintiffs against Saudi Arabia. He was trying to create a pro-democracy NGO. All of these things are anathema to Saudi Arabia and extremely, um, you know, would be considered outrageous. And so I think there's a sense from the top people in Saudi Arabia that he was really had got, become traitorous. And so I think that helps explain it a little bit better. It wasn't so much his columns, although those were also kind of incendiary in some ways, but th they were really just one part of a multiple part problem that he was posing to them. And um, I think it's interesting as well how you talk about uh, one of the first things he does is when he comes to power is uh, he brings like international polling organizations into the country to sort of gauge public opinion. Um, do, we have actually, uh, do we actually have any reliable information on how popular he is as a leader? There's not great polling in Saudi Arabia. You know, the, the government, you know, the royal family and the Mount of have hired some people to do some polling, but it's not like in the US or in Europe where you've got opinion polls. But anecdotally, from what we could tell, he's, he's pretty popular. And for, and for understandable reasons, you know, you, you, again, you have people who you couldn't go to the movies, you couldn't go to a concert, you couldn't get coffee with a member of the opposite sex unless you were married or, you know, blood related to that person. And now those barriers have been broken down and, and it's, it's a much more livable place for younger people. So, you know, I, I think he's still, I think he, he is quite popular. Another thing to understand about people in a monarchy is like in a democracy, um, if I don't like the president, I mean, I'm going to complain about him. I'm going to, I'm going to be outraged because I feel like I should have the right to elect the person I want. And if I, if I think the president is bad, then everyone's going to know. But in a monarchy, they give no control over who you get. So I think people, you know, are a lot more inclined to be like, well, he's given us some good stuff. So, so great because there's not really a, anything you can do about it. So I think he's pretty popular. Um, you know, all of the other options for, uh, you know, for, for leadership in the country are much older men who are much more, you know, economically and socially conservative. And I think there's a lot less reason for optimism, no matter how flawed people might think Mohammed bin Salman is. And is it fair to say that the country is heading in a, a more liberal and democratic direction or is that a red herring, do you think? I think it's 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 really important when you think of liberalization that you divide it into two groups, social liberalization and political liberalization. Saudi Arabia is undergoing unprecedented social liberalization and and the religious um, uh, orthodoxy is is sort of weakening and in and, and the early stages of changing the, this thing that we think of as Wahhabism um, is no longer the dominant uh, message the way it used to be. And, and that could have even global effects uh, as, as time goes on. But in terms of political liberalization, there is pretty much none. Um, and, and there's no real signs that we'll be having any of that in Saudi Arabia. I think the, the, the most thing you can do as a Saudi citizen without getting into trouble is to criticize a particular ministry or the execution of a strategy so like if the Ministry of Water really, you know, rolls out a new plan and it really flops, people are, are kind of permitted to criticize that even publicly. But it is, it's a red line to suggest that the overall economic plans are wrong or even any specific economic plans are wrong or, you know, and, and I think the other thing that's important is 
you can't protest for a change, but you can um, you can you can sort of beseech the rulers for change. And so, you know, if you try to if you try to protest or or go about it the way that you do in other countries in the world, you'll very likely end up in in prison or or at least just threatened or silenced. So I think that those things have no real sign of changing anytime soon. Yeah, and I think in a way it's grown less democratic in, in two senses. I mean, it's it certainly never democratic because it's it's a monarchy, but uh, in in the sort of upper levels of the royal family in the past, you know, every every king there, there was the founder of the kingdom, and then every king for fifty years had been another one of his sons, and the way the next king was determined, it would be the oldest son who all the other sons could agree was fit to rule, and so generally the next oldest person, the next oldest son of the founder would be the king, but there was some sort of consensus around who the next king would be. So it's not democracy, but it's something other than, you know, an automatic passing of the crown. Now, um, under, you know, King Salman has greatly cut out the number of people who determined who the, his successor is going to be. He determined who his success, successor was going to be without permission from anyone. There's a council of princes that sort of signed off in Mohammed bin Salman, but they didn't really have a choice. So it's gotten less democratic in that sense, but in terms of the street, in terms of like regular people, it's never really been democratic, but in the past there was much more opportunity or there was some more opportunity to criticize, as Bradley said. And now, there, now you know, criticism is, is, is tolerated even less. So I think by any measure, it's a, it's a, people have less participation in their own governance than they've had in the past in Saudi Arabia. And I read the book like over a month ago now, so I can't remember exactly if you do talk about it. But do, uh, what's what's the impact of the coronavirus on the on the country? Um, I mean, they they've had they've been hit like any other country. Um, they've locked down in, in in a pretty serious way, and they haven't really come out of it the way that even other countries have. So, as far as I understand, schools are still shut for in person teaching that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the macroeconomic impacts are, are pretty serious. I mean, Saudi Arabia is, it you know, depends on the rest of the economy of the world kind of booming along for oil sales. And, and so they've been suffering, I think, from the, from, especially from the low price of oil and, and also all of their kind of economic diversification plans, while still relatively early, they're, they're, not, they're not moving along at the same speed that they had hoped. So, and then and, and as a result, they've, they've, um, started taxing Saudi people in a way that they hadn't been taxed before. There's now a 15% value added tax. And so it's, it's definitely tight, you know, it's tight over there. And uh, I think I'll finish with this one. Uh, you've talked about how unprecedented um, the power that he's amassed is. Uh, how secure is he in the long term? I I mean, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I try to stay in the business of predicting the future because um, I'm not good at it. But, you know, in, what it looks like is that absent um, some kind of, you know, shockingly violent episode, which has happened before in Saudi Arabia. There, there's been a king who's been assassinated by a family member. But um, outside of something like that, it, it's hard to see any direct threats to, his, to him taking the, the crown now. Um, his father's the king, his father wants him to do it. I, it's hard to see any kind of insurgency from you know, any constituency in Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, longer term, if there is some faster than expected move to renewable energy, if oil prices really go down and Saudi population growth continues to go up and he's faced with you know, a medium term economic crisis, then you know, things are very unpredictable and, and you know, in you know, totalitarian countries with, you know, struggling economies tend to be unstable. So it's hard to predict the future, but in, in the, from what we can see, it looks like he'll be the next Saudi king and he could be the next Saudi king for 60 years, 50 years. Uh, I don't know, Bradley might have a more nuanced view on that. No, I think uh, my view is that at this moment in time, we can't see another path for Saudi Arabia other than him being a long-term monarch. Um, but then again, nobody could see Mohammed bin Salman coming out of nowhere to become the crown prince who seized all the power and became the most powerful person. So, you know, there's a number of things that could happen, new perfect storms. And, um, and so he has a lot of, of, of risk 
because of the way he's done things that that makes it all very very difficult to predict that's for sure